start by introducing our wonderful speakers today who have kindly joined all the way from New York. <laughs> so we have Nancy Loveland, CEO and founder of Crisis Sex Line, and Natalia Dayan, the manager of international partnerships at Crisis Sex Line as well. Um, thank you for joining us. This is a session from Stigma to Strength, a conversation on mental health, leadership, and texting. So to get it right away started, I'd like to just throw in a poll for the audience and see how we're feeling today because we're talking on mental health, so why not? <laughs> and Natalia, I'd like to start with you. For all the folks who are not familiar with Crisis Text Line, if you can give us a brief overview of the amazing work you guys do. Yes, of course. And thank you. Thank you for having us. I think this is such an important conversation to have, um, especially with, you know, groups, um, different communities and all over the world is such a global thing, mental health. So Crisis Text Line is a nonprofit organization that provides confidential, free, 24-7 uh, crisis support services to anyone uh, via text message. We're in the mental health space, uh, but we're a tech company. So we're kind of a, a bit of a unicorn. Uh, we uh, created the first platform that allows for crisis uh, counseling via text. And we're constantly using and creating new technology to make us faster or reaching people, more efficient, our volunteers more efficient, and just overall a better uh, service. We are also data informed. Um, we, with over, I think we're over 145 million messages exchanged. It's a lot of data. Uh, we use that to inform our trainings, our product development, our processes, who, you know, uh, internally. And we also put that data out into the world for free on crisistrends.org. And we want to encourage and empower journalists, uh, decision makers, and just the public in general to use the data to rely on facts, which, you know, nowadays it's sort of a luxury to have facts to lean on when we're thinking and making decisions um, on data. So that's a big of who we are, right? Of, um, I think, a great uh, summary of Crisis Text Line. Thank you. And it's amazing the work you do. I'm just reading the polls now and we've got Oh, wow, enthusiasm. So 35% are strong, feeling strong and motivated. So let's keep it going. <laughs> Great to hear you. Um, so thank you for, for that introduction. And I know you're passionate on data and on the whole analysis of trends. So Nancy, this question is for you. I, do you really believe that texting can save lives? I do. I do. I mean, we've seen it. We have, we've got proof. So um, we handle about 4,000 conversations a day in the US alone and closer to 6,000 when you consider our work in uh, Canada, the UK and Ireland. And um, every day about 1% of that um, is a super high risk. So someone has already swallowed a bottle of pills or they have a gun in their hand um, and in those less than 1%, we need to actually call 999 or 911 um, to send an active rescue um, to, to intervene. But about 22% of our messages actually indicate suicidal ideation. So about one in five, a little more than one in five of our conversations involve somebody really um, considering it and thinking about it. So think about that delta. We de-escalate from the 22% down to only 1% where we can't de-escalate. So it means the vast majority of the time we are successfully able to convince somebody to put that bottle of pills, to flush it down the toilet, or to put the gun away, or to go wake up their partner or mom and share these feelings and get to a cool calm instead of doing something dangerous. So um, text can be super, super effective. I'll add that it's actually really effective with people who are young, poor, rural, and diverse. Um, and why, and why that's, I think, that? like, why, exactly, why is that, texting yeah. the, the channel? That's the way that our data skews. That's who's texting us. 
um, far more than other people. That's who's texting us. And, um, and I think it's because there's a veil of ignorance. So you don't hear someone's voice. You don't see what they look like. And so all of that bias, um, all of these marginalized people who might be worried about bias by phone or by video or in person, um, it's a safe space because it's anonymous and it's confidential, it's private. And I, I imagine that also plays a role in the whole stigma around mental health, right? I think that's right. I think, I think we are making it easier to reach out for help. So 68% of people tell us they've shared something with us they've never shared with another human being. So this is the first time they've ever opened up about um, hearing voices or feeling anxiety or having a crush on their best friend. It's the first time they've ever, they've ever confessed that to anyone. The other thing that's worth noting is that we see the word today six times more than we see the word yesterday, last week, or any other time frame. I think because it's text, you don't have to wait for a quiet moment where everybody is gone. You don't have to make an appointment. Um, uh, and so we get people during a conference call. We get people from the back of the school bus. We get people during a family dinner where people are shouting at each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get people in quarantine with, with a lot stuck with other people around them who it would be dangerous if they overheard them. So text uh, makes it possible for us to get you in that moment, in the heat of the moment, when we can help you make a safe choice, tip you in a healthy direction. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And, and you have the 24-7 service, right? Oh, it's yes. definitely 24-7. Uh, most of our volume actually comes in the middle of the night. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And, and by the way, in, in, you mentioned this quarantine, how you're able to reach people, even if, if remote, well, actually remote, <laughs> remotely. <laughs> so, yep. Natalia, there I want to know, What trends have you seen ever since that started because of the quarantine or since COVID? Have, has anything interested, the good, the bad, the random? Can you yes. let us know more on, on the trends there? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so since uh, quarantine started and adding to Nancy what she's saying, like text message, especially now during the pandemic, has made, this, has made um, mental health supports much more accessible, right? you have access to your phone, you have access to support. Um, so being in a medium where people already are um, makes it easier to reach out. So we've seen different trends overall, right? We've been tracking. So one of the things that uh, Crisis Text Line did and we were able to do is as soon as sort of the pandemic hit and, and isolation, we started gathering uh, data that is COVID specific, right? We were able to, to do that. So we have a lot of rich data that is uh, around COVID. Um, we've seen that, as Nancy mentioned, we're usually our um, users, our texters are younger, right? Um, and now we're, they're still young, but we're seeing that the age group of 18 to 34 has been, you know, that use has increased. Um, and I think Nancy mentioned this before, but this is the group that has been disrupted a lot, right? Jobs or universities and going back home. There's a lot of disruption in, in their lifestyle. So we see them reaching out a lot more. We've seen a 40% increase in texters just overall, right? Uh, we've seen a spike in our volume. Um, and we see our data, it, we've seen the trends that we've seen are in sort of three ways. Uh, we've seen the first way was anxiety, right? Everyone, the unknown, what's happening, pandemic. First, you know, we never experienced this before. So a lot of anxiety around that. The second way, which is one personally, I fear the most, and I think all of us fear the most, and we prep the most for, it was the impact of the quarantine itself, right? Being isolated, uh, we've seen more depression, increase in substance abuse, we've seen a 78% increase in domestic violence, 44% uh, increase in sexual abuse. Um, so all of that, you know, that's, you mentioned like the bad, the ugly, that's sort of a, the second wave. And the third way, which is what we're seeing now, Um, it's the trauma of the losing jobs, the trauma of grief, grieving someone they lost. And I think the trauma also of the uh, losing normalcy, right, of your normal life. You're grieving what you lost, the life that you had. Um, and since we are in a group of, uh, you know, 
Latinoamericanos. I wanted to share just a couple of data that we have on uh, our Latino population in the U.S. But we've seen, um, for example, we know that in the U.S., uh, Latinos and Latinas have been disproportionately impacted by COVID because a lot of them are essential workers um, and uh, our texters that identify as Latino or Latina have a significantly high rate of uh, experiencing racism or discrimination, financial issues, a recent lo uh, loss of a loved one. So that might be, you know, um, an essential worker um, and difficulty caring, caring for loved ones. So compared to other texters, Latinos have rate higher on this during COVID. The hopeful thing is that Latinos more than any other texters have found uh, resiliency and hope through helping family and friends, which I think just speaks to like the tight community really? and how much we uh, thrive when we are connecting with our close uh, relationships, our close uh, families and friends. I think that uh, it really translates in the data. I was hoping you were getting to a silver lining. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> there is one, there is one. <laughs> great, and, and great to see that people can, are really relying on, on their close relationships and I agree with you it, it speaks a lot tells a lot about the Latin culture I, I, I agree and okay so we've seen this rates and also in in midst of the pandemic another trend maybe I have observed and a lot of people here probably have as well is there are so many issues to address there are so many incredible initiatives rising so Nancy, I would like to ask you, why should we make mental health a priority these days? Why would it be important for people to really uh, destine, allocate resources, name it time, money, you name it, on mental health? So um, I would say that mental health underlies everything, that if we don't feel strong, and we don't feel positive and motivated and hopeful, we can't do anything. Um, I mean, especially as social entrepreneurs and social change people, um, you, you can't be a pessimist and, um, and think you're gonna change the world and think you're gonna make it better. Um, that just requires an innate optimism and source of strength. We like to say you can't pour from an empty cup and so I think it's super important that everybody has a full cup right now um, so they can help neighbors, friends, colleagues, family. Um, I think that the scars of COVID, I, I hope that we crush it, curtail it, and I hope that happens soon. But I think the scars of this time, the PTSD, the quarantines, the job loss, the grief, I think that's gonna last for years, years. And, um, and so I think it's really important that we invest in this um, with um, funding, but also with our time, um, with our prioritization, which frankly doesn't cost anything um, to do this for yourself, to make sure that you are doing things that help you feel strong, um, that you're choosing the positive when you can. Uh, when it's possible, um, that you're choosing healthy things whenever possible. Um, I think it's just, it's super important now more than ever. Yeah, I, I agree that you can't help if you're not <laughs> good yourself. And this is why I think it's so interesting, the plans of expansion you've recently announced. And Natalia, I don't know if you want to uh, let us in more details of this exciting journey at Crisis Sex Line. Yeah, for sure. So Crisis Sex Line started in the U.S. and, you know, uh, recently, and we expanded. We are currently in the U.K., Canada, and Ireland. Um, but one thing that we say is that, you know, pain is not an American thing or a country-specific thing. Pain is global. But so is empathy, right? So we can find people with pain anywhere in the world and we can find people with empathy in anywhere in any language that can help and support one another 
So before COVID, we were already thinking at a global level and global expansion. And we set a goal to expand in five languages in the next five years. But then COVID happened and uh, we realized that accessible mental health support is needed now more than ever. I personally heard, I've heard from organizations and people from all over the world about you know, bringing crisis text line because it's such a um, unique way of supporting people and so accessible right now. Um, so we, keeping that in mind that we need to do this faster, we kept the same goal, but we cut the time in half. Um, so it's five languages in the next two and a half years. No and pressure. I am, <laughs> no pressure. Easy peasy. Uh, but we're excited. It's a challenge, but we're very excited to take it on. And, and we know that, you know, Crisis Text Line has, you know, we're very capable of uh, doing that. So we are, um, I'm very excited that our first global expansion is going to be Spanish. To me, it's very <laughs> personal and exciting to be able to help uh, people in my language. And um, I, um, yes, it's just, it's thrilling. So what we're doing is we're going to, expand crisis tax line to Spanish right now, country specific. That means that anyone in the world, anytime that speaks Spanish is able to get support from someone anywhere that speaks Spanish. So we're doing this uh, by uh, partnering with organizations that already exist in the Spanish speaking world, collaborating with one another. Um, and it's just a beautiful network and a beautiful yeah, network of empathy um, superheroes that are going to be available for people to, you know, reach out at any point. And I love how you, how you name them empathy superheroes. And yes, can you just delve into a bit more of why do you call them empathy superheroes? We call empathy MVPs. We call them, I just call them empathy superheroes. <laughs> empathy MVPs, uh, because that's what they're doing, right? So we train our own volunteers and really what we're training them on, you need to obviously have your own sort of innate empathy, but we're teaching them how to show that empathy. How do you translate empathy to text message, right? You can be really, uh, you can, you know, when you're talking to someone, you know, you make a face and you're like, oh yes, you're, you know, you can do that. So uh, teaching the skill of, of translating that to text is what we do in our training and our, um, our uh, volunteers do that. Uh, in a great way. I mean, our quality shows for that. Our quality for um, our surveys, I think it's at 91%. Nancy, if you have wow. more updated data, but um, yeah. that's what we have. I think <laughs> right now it's a 91%. So it shows that our volunteers are the most empathic people in the world right now. They're sitting there from home, they're volunteering their time to help strangers. Um, you know, and this is not unique to the US. This is, you can find people anywhere that want to help um, and have that empathy. And that is so strong, especially now that we cannot connect with people, as you say, in person, or maybe are not able to even have a video conferencing service. So amazing to hear that. And amazing to hear that you're expanding to Spanish. I know Please. our audience should be excited. You can, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of, all I'm thanks excited. to Natalia. That's really <laughs> That's really because of Natalia. Natalia has been the one pushing for this for a long time. And so um, uh, kudos to you, really, Natalia. That's why this is happening. Thank you. And thank you for giving me uh, the space to move this <laughs> forward. This is really, really... Oh, no, um, you're right. You were right. Now we just got to make it happen. Yeah. I'm excited about that. And, and now I'd like to talk a bit more on, since we have an audience of entrepreneurs, investors, capacity builders, which by the way, if you can uh, tell us on the chat what profile you, you fit in most or another one I haven't mentioned, we'd love to hear uh, what the profile of the audience is. Um, but since we are talking to these people, they're dealing with a tremendous amount of stress. They're, in a regular basis, they're just in the uncertainty roller coaster. And then you add in that spice of COVID, <laughs> it's going to explode. So <laughs> yeah. I'd like to uh, get into a bit of some of the ways uh, Crisis Text Line has dealt with this. And I know, Nancy, you call yourself a wartime entrepreneur. So this is your moment. 
can you can you let us in how did CTL react to COVID and yeah as an organization? So um, I think the things that we see in our data for our texters we also lean into as a company. So, um, so for example, one of the things that we see for everyday people, for our texters, is that it's a very big, overwhelming, unpredictable feeling and time. And so shrinking things into a more manageable time period, um, saying things like, what are you gonna do tonight to feel strong? What are your plans for food tomorrow? Um, just smaller time frames, one day at a time. Um, and so I think we, we've shifted to weekly staff meetings. We used to do every other week. Um, we're having more frequent meetings as teams, even though we're, we're remote. We're trying to shrink the timelines for goals so they feel more manageable um, and are more, uh, we can feel more productive. That's as a source of strength. We've added uh, daily meditation every day at noon. It's a free meditation. Natalia and I are often in there together. At noon, it's just 15 minutes, but it's a nice way to feel centered and see a lot of your colleagues. Um, so we added that. Uh, but the, the kinds of things that you could set a consistent pace, I think especially as social entrepreneurs, and frankly, I know you have some investors here too, it's hard to see a return you know, social entrepreneurship is, um, it's long. And um, you don't often see impact regularly. I think in this time period to um, create uh, steps instead of leaps, to have shorter bits, to give you a sense of accomplishment and clarity and a way to really foster community and frankly, an excuse for celebration um, to take those moments of joy and those moments of accomplishment in smaller pieces um, gives you the opportunity. Everyone's looking for something to be happy about right now. Yeah, I, I know I'm happy about cookie dough later. <laughs> mm. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and you know, it's interesting. I was reading a research uh, of Michael Freeman and it stated that over, like 49% of entrepreneurs were dealing with mental health issues regularly. And this was before the pandemic. So <laughs> well, that's, actually, that's a better number than I've heard. You know, there are studies, there was a study on the Ashoka fellows that 65% of them are divorced. There's a study on the um, Schwabies from the World Economic Forum that something like more than 70% acknowledge a depressive episode in the last 12 months. And there's a study on, I think it's the Skoll um, awardees about uh, substance abuse. Um, that's a very high percentage of people acknowledge uh, an issue with drinking. Um, the social entrepreneur space is challenging. I mean, we are all putting our hearts out there every day and we believe so much in our cause and we believe that it's so urgent that um, there are a lot of mental and behavioral health issues in this, in this community, in this career space. And, and I know you've mentioned in, in some other interviews that part of this is because you're held as a parent, as a leader, as an entrepreneur to another standard. So especially now that you, you know, you're, you're dealing with being held at another standard and you're throwing it a lot of uncertainty worldwide. What would be some of the healthy habits or, you know, aside from shortening the, the time frames and, and such, what would be some healthy habits that you would encourage people and entrepreneurs and leaders, parents to, to do to cope with this? I think when people ask that, they expect me to talk about eating healthy and exercise, and I'm not the poster <laughs> child for either of those. I'm like, I'm like, I'm with you right there on the cookie dough. You know, it's 10.30 in the morning, like, that seems like a great breakfast. I, um, ha, yeah, I've been making so much banana bread and, like, brownies. Yeah, no, I'm not, I actually am going to say that I think that we need more laughter. Just more laughter in the social change space. I think too, too many social entrepreneurs, look, we're dealing with some crazy, awful things. 
racism and poverty and institutionalized racism and institutionalized poverty and abuse and violence. I mean, uh, there's so much bad stuff out there and we have to laugh. We have to laugh. We have to take the work seriously and not take ourselves too seriously um, or it will be too painful. Um, so I, I actually think we all need to laugh more and you got to find those moments of joy and those things that are just ridiculous and laugh at them and, um, and create those fun things on our teams. You'd look in the old days, if you had to go to a football game, if you had to take your, and I know what football is to all of you and I mean it the right way, soccer, <laughs> but if you have to go out to a, you have to go to a football game to have a good time with your team, or if you have to go to a, to a restaurant to have, dinner together and drinks to have fun. You're really just saying that fun and laughter and community happens out there, like outside our office. And I think we all need to find ways that laughter and fun and tradition happens here, inside our companies, inside our projects and organizations and communities. And you know, I think what you say is, is super important. And, and I'd like to know, Natalia, I, a bit more of how is this lived through CTL. I know you mentioned a fail fest, so yes. I don't know. Can, can you let us in more details of how is this lived through Crisis Tech Line? <laughs> yes. Oh my God. So I can speak. I am such a fan of uh, Crisis Tech Line culture, and I can have an entire session just on that. But um, just to keep it, I think what Nancy said and what something that Crisis Tech Line does very well is this fun aspect, right? And, and we deal with really heavy stuff, right? We talk about like suicides and child abuse. This is something that we take very seriously and we work hard to support and help. But then again, we as a team, we try to keep it light and keep it fun and make it great to go to work and go to the office when we can, you know? Uh, we have impromptu um, snow fights uh, in the office that we have <laughs> snowballs that we throw around and just like a way to release some energy. So fail fest is a great example. I think fail fest is where we uh, sort of celebrate our failures and we learn from those. We, someone from the team every, I think we do this every year or every six months, uh, someone from the team will present on a fail that they did something they tried and didn't work. Um, and we make it fun. They have to wear like a pink boa around them, um, <laughs> make it a theme of a song or a theme of a movie. Everything has to be related. And we make it a fun learning moment, right? We, they talk about what, um, what has been a fail, what have we learned from it, what can we do differently, right? And we celebrate that in a way. It's like, you know, fails bring us closer to what's right. So uh, we, make, we take that as an opportunity to celebrate rather than, you know, uh, make it a serious uh, thing. And I think uh, Crisis Text Line in that is, has implemented a lot of like fun elements um, to keep it light. And I think another thing from organizational point of view, um, and especially from leaders, it's uh, so important that uh, mental health, especially now, it's recognized, right? People are under a lot of stress. We should recognize, and because that gives people permission to recognize them in themselves, right? To see like, oh, wait, I, I am going through a lot of anxiety right now or I'm feeling really tense or stressed. So I need to identify what's going on with me. So you can then take care of it. If you don't identify it, then you're not gonna do, you're not gonna take care of that. Um, and I, I think Nancy said it, Nancy, Nancy said it a great example a few weeks ago. I don't know if you even remember Nancy, but a few weeks ago during staff meeting, Nancy said um, to the entire staff, she said, your well-being is more important than your productivity. Just saying that it gives you like from the leadership, you know, hearing that it's, you know, gives, allows you to say, oh, I'm going to prioritize myself and I need to be well so I can do well by others. Yeah, it's walking the talk in, in a certain way. And yeah. speaking of walking the talk, since you opened the celebration for failures, I don't know if either of you remember a particular funny, and we do not have to say who was this person, <laughs> but a particular failure lived in CTL that you just like to uh, tell us a story on that. I mean, there have been so many. We fail all the <laughs> time. Failure is where you get... Um, failure is just the step towards innovation. Um, 
uh, maybe one of my favorite failures happened at my other organization where I was before this at Do Something. And actually the person who ran this and failure is now at Crisis Text Line with us, but is Freddie. This is a good story. Um, at one point in time, so, so Do Something texts its members. There's about 6 million people now. At the time, there was about 2 million people on the list. And we had a program that someone had asked us to send to just the young people who identified that they were Jewish. And it was something to do, it was like a motivation for them to volunteer more. And by mistake, Freddie texted all 2 million people saying, it's great that you're Jewish, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and all 2 million people. When really there were only about 15,000 who were supposed to get that text message. And the number of text messages we got back that were frankly anti-Semitic and racist um, were higher than the number of people that we thought were Jewish. So we got more than 15,000 messages back being like, I'm not Jewish and saying some pretty horrible things. And so uh, Freddie's initial response was to delete them from our mailing list. Like we don't want racist, anti-Semitic people on our list. And I said, no, 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 no this is actually the chance to change hearts and minds. Like this is the moment, how we react right now could change everything for those kids. So Freddie made an I'm sorry playlist <laughs> with really funny songs like Britney Spears, Whoops, I Did It Again, <laughs> and um, Cher's song, If I Could Turn Back Time, <laughs> and like a ton of funny things and then sent all of them uh, the playlist, like sent another text message and was like, whoops, you're not Jewish. I messed that one up, um, but here's what we're doing and here's what you can do and here's a, a playlist. And so we ended up with a ton of subscribers in this playlist and a lot of people appreciating Freddie's sense of humor and humility. Um, we even did um, some media around the fact that we messed up and how we recovered and uh, it was pretty amazing. Um, and a lot of those people stayed with us for a long time because they appreciated um, the humor and also that they were called out, some of them, on their racist response. Like, hey, I'm an actual human being here seeing these messages. That's not a nice thing to say. You know, it was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and bringing laughter into, into our everyday job as well. <laughs> yeah. And you can see, like, Freddie ended up being promoted. And Freddie is someone who I took with me from Do Something to Crisis Text Line. Because what I love about Freddie is they love to learn. And they're not afraid to fail. And um, they take feedback well. And, um, and they have a sense of humor. I like that. I like it. And now I, I, I just want to be mindful of the time because I know that a lot of people are asking through the chat box. I don't know if Analu, can you, uh, we'll open up for a couple of, of yeah, questions of course. before we wrap up. Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. So Mitzi Gallaga asks for organizations, which members has to be involved to care for mental health for the staff? Oh, well, I think everybody. I think if you silo this to just the people who are in human resources or people ops, then you're role modeling that this just belongs over there. I mean, we're a tech company basically. And I think that our CTO and all of our engineers need to care about this too. I think this is one of those things that everybody needs to care about. Um, kind of like everybody needs to care about um, your users or your uh, clients or um, uh, who you're taking care of. Everybody in the company should also care about. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Mitzi. Thank you. Perfect. We have a couple more. Um, Carolina Alonso asks, what are the challenges that you will face in the Latin American market that you haven't met in the U.S.? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. And I think we're also excited to see with those maybe but I think uh, one of the things that the stigma around mental health, uh, stigma around some specific issues um, might be one of the challenges that we face. Um, we all know that uh, gender violence is huge in Latin America. Um, so we're prepared to enter that space uh, a little bit more um, stronger and just see how we can help and collaborate. We're, so here in the U.S., one of the things that we do is we collaborate with organizations, sometimes with governments, with emergency services, 
So we're, you know, we have a whole team. It's not just, we're not on our own. We collaborate with people. We believe in that and, and helping one another. So I think in Latin America, that it's seeing what resources are available for us to collaborate with and to create a well-rounded service. I think that's one of the, the challenges that we're looking forward to uh, face and, and, and solving. Like, do we need to create something that doesn't exist uh, if we can find it? I also think uh, we're American. Oh mm. my God, that's not a good thing right now. Um, <laughs> like the only thing we're leading right now in the world is COVID infections. And <laughs> like, I mean, uh, so I think, you know, um, I don't know if I were in Guatemala, if I were in Argentina, would I want to tell the Americans how I'm feeling about things? Not really. So it's super important that we partner with great people on the ground and that we, um, you know, leverage strong people on the on the ground to to lead, frankly, um, the service in Latin America and in Spanish in general. It can't be the Americans. It can't be. Thank you, and 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 Alu, I think we'll take one last question Perfect. before we wrap up. Perfect. So uh, our last question is from Irene Velasco, and she asks: All your services are with human response. Have you used chatbots for common responses? What has been your experience? So we're a hundred percent human. We're we're really I'm really human. We uh, we are a hundred percent human. Um, so we could. We could build chatbots. We have enough volume, velocity, and variety, and we have the um, the engineering expertise to be able to build that. And we just decided, you know what, with 68% of people telling us something they've never shared with another human, you deserve a human on the other side. If, if you're going to share and open up like that, you deserve a kind, trained, capable person on the other side who's, who's going to be an empathy MVP or an empathy superstar. And um, that's what you deserve. And so that's what's going to be there. What, with the way we use technology is to make those humans faster and more accurate, um, but not to replace them. I like to say it's kind of like a calculator that I could do long division, but I'm going to be faster and more accurate if you give me a calculator. Um, so, uh, so we are our crisis counselors with tools to make them faster and more accurate. For example, we use algorithms that rank the queue. So instead of taking you in chronological order, we take you in order of severity because we want to make sure that we take the high risk cases first. Like a hospital will take a gunshot wound or a heart attack before someone with a sprained ankle. Uh, we should work like a like an emergency um, department of a hospital, and who gets wheeled in first should be the high risk cases. So our algorithms do that, but no, it's it's all human beings. Perfect, thank you. And I'm I'm sharing now the results of of the many polls we threw in the audience. But I I was very happy to to see that ninety percent, ninety five percent, sorry of the people here believe that mental health should be a priority today. And unfortunately, 70% do agree that, yes, the stigma around it is real. So I would just like to wrap up with the two of you saying tweet style, so 280 characters. What are some things that people can do today to make mental health a priority within their family, within their colleagues, within their selves. What are some, like, what is that advice? How can we build resilience for tomorrow today? Well, I'll go and I'll give Natalia the last word here today. So what I would say is to ask people, not just how are you feeling, how are you doing? Ask them to, to tell you on a scale of one to five. What's your number? It makes people be more specific and it's an easier thing to respond to. How are you feeling on a scale of one to five? And sometimes offer your own number, like I'm a four today. Perfect. Yeah. And I think um, I would say more awareness, you know, educate yourself. Like, you know, sometimes we have feelings of anxiety and we don't know what that is. Uh, so educating yourself around what mental health is and what it feels like so you can recognize it. Perfect. And uh, just last, the last word would be, since you're saying recognize, 
recognizing and awareness. I know you publish, as you mentioned, trends and all types of information on mental health. So how can people get involved? How can they get to know more on CTL? And if they want to partner somehow or volunteer, what would be the best way to reach out to both of you? Yeah, uh, so we are especially in Latin America and especially we're looking for incredible people on the ground. Uh, we're partnering with um, organizations, but people with expertise in mental health space, tech space, any of that, you can reach out to me directly at, I can put it in the chat, but it's Natalia at crisistextline.org, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, so they can reach out to me directly about anything that has to do with Spanish and expertise and partnership possibilities. I'm glad to, you know, set up a chat. Perfect. Well, thank you both. I know it's not early for you, Nancy, but for Natalia and I, it is. So <laughs> I appreciate the effort and it was such a pleasure having you both here. And thank you for our wonderful audience who, who was interactive and, and participated through this session. So thank you all. And uh, I, I hope to see you through Flea at home. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye, Bye. everyone. Boring.